Hello, this is John Smallwood, Senior Wealth Advisor at Smallwood Wealth Management. I'd like to welcome you to Wealth Curve Talk with John. This is the podcast where we dive into financial concepts to help people understand a little bit more detail of what's going on and expand on those topics. Recently, December 19th, 2019, the SECURE Act was signed into law. This is going to impact your retirement plan and the way you plan your estate. It's a big change for many. Now, we talk about the rules of the institution in previous podcasts, and we talk about planning and long-term planning. And what we always talk about is the rules in which we make decisions by are constantly changing. And as those rules change, they provide or create a different outcome for many people. So what, what we want to talk about here is these changes that are in the SECURE Act, some of them are great. Some of them are going to be difficult for a lot of, a lot of people. The big move that seems exciting is that the required minimum distribution is age is moving from 70 and a half to 72. So it's about a year and a half additional time that people can defer their retirement plans beginning in 1-1 of 2020. Now, the calculation is an interesting calculation. Basically, the IRS wants the money out, so they say we need to take a required minimum distribution based upon the uniform lifetime tables. That calculation is done using the previous year's December 31st valuation. And if you don't take that money out, there's a 50% penalty, plus you have to take it out and pay tax. So that tax can be quite onerous if you don't get this calculation right. So the relief is now you can push it back to 72. You're still, if you turn 70 and a half in 2019, you still need to take an RMD for 2012, but it can be pushed according to what we're reading to, to April 1st of next year. The new law also says instead of December 31st of the year in which you turn 70 and a half, when this new law is in fact in implemented, when you turn 72, the year in which you have 72, you have to April 1st of the following year to take that required minimum distribution. So depending on the math, you could get some extra time there. You know, that seems a little odd to me, but that's what we're reading and that's what we're seeing. And that's the guidance that we're actually getting at this point in time frame. One of the things that I've been concerned about is that when you push the age back and you have the uniform, the life expectancy distribution period tables, that's what you're basing the calculation on. But in November of 2019, the IRS submitted changes to those tables, which is basically increasing the life expectancy, which is going to basically probably not change the required minimum distribution number at all from 72 on. Our concern was when you move it back to 72, or you now have a shorter time frame, therefore the required minimum distributions might be greater. If that IRS table is adopted, it will probably not change the required minimum distributions all that much, except giving you an extra year and a half. One of the key things also that I saw is that you can continue to contribute to a retirement plan IRA after age 70 and a half, where now you really can't. So that's a nice benefit. The big problem that we see is that the concept of a stretch IRA or a decedent IRA has been basically lifted. It, it, the new law eliminates the possibility of a stretch IRA. Currently, if a non-spouse dies and you're the beneficiary of an IRA, that IRA would get rolled over into that person's name, deceased IRA for the benefit of the beneficiary. Let's assume for a second it's a $100,000 IRA. 
and you're rolling it over to that person's name, deceased, for, for the benefit of you, and let's assume for a second that you're 50. Your required minimum distribution on that plan would be, you know, based on being 50 and spreading it out over the life expectancy table. So the minimum distribution is quite low, two and a half, maybe 3%. So in essence, you, you were able to continue the compounding of the tax deferral with very little withdrawal pressure. Now the change is they've gone back to a 10 year period. So starting in 2020, anybody dying in 2020, the inherited IRA will have to be collapsed over a 10 year period. This is pretty important because when you have that small distribution that I was mentioning, you could pull the money out and kind of play, you know, with different tax brackets. Now, if you inherit a large IRA, which we see many of these out there, where children will inherit large IRAs, it will then force that income out over a 10 year period and potentially push those beneficiaries into a much higher tax bracket and expose more to other factors that might impact their college planning or benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So it's pushing the money out to you faster, paying more taxes on that. And if you look at what's going on, we have more baby boomers ever, you know, retiring with lots of IRA balances that are going to basically be inherited over, you know, the next 20 years, pushing a lot of tax money into the IRS. What we're seeing is that the, the current stretch IRAs that are out there appear to be grandfathered and anybody dying before December 31st of 2019 will have the ability to continue the lifetime stretch. The lifetime stretch was something that came in in the middle 90s that I thought was fantastic because prior to that, it was a five-year period. So this is a significant change. This is going to change the way people do their estate planning. It's going to change the way you should take distributions. You should, you know, you have to rethink your strategy to make sure that it's consistent with efficient planning, which efficient planning, in my opinion, is lower taxes, lower risk, lower fees and costs, increased retirement income, put more benefits and more protection around the wealth and pass more to your family. If it doesn't do those seven things, then you really shouldn't do it. But now we're, we're being forced to increase taxes due to this law change for many people. A couple of interesting changes also for people that are employers, small businesses that are sponsoring retirement plans, the tax credit has increased for that. It looks like it's about $500 to, you know, incentive to install a, a plan. Workers who have less than a thousand hours typically have been, you know, they've been excluded from retirement plans. This law allows people with less than a thousand hours for the employer to be included in the employer plans. So this is something that you're, you know, as a sponsor of a small retirement plan, it's going to change your calculations and your contributions. If you're doing a matching contribution, and your workers under a thousand hours are now included, it could dramatically increase the amount of match that you have. So this is a time to really look at your plan and understand how that's going to impact the, the corporate cash flows. The other big change, and this is really going to make Ken Fisher very angry, is the adoption of lifetime income products into a retirement plan. So the use of an annuity can be used and also can be portable. So the lifetime income benefits that can be derived with many products out there can now be compounded. And if the person wants to distribute it out to an IRA, they'll have the full right to do that. That product, you know, up until this point could not be distributed as a product. It would have to be crashed subject to you know potential surrender charges and you then lost your guaranteed income benefit. So the use of annuities in a retirement plan 
is now going to be something that people will have the ability to take a portion of these plan assets and generate guaranteed income. One of the biggest problems that we see in a retirement plan is that people do not have enough predictable income to cover a large portion of their expenses. Most of it's variable. This is an opportunity to capture and build and grow those sources so that when you retire, you take out that potential of running out of money in retirement, which would be one of the worst things possible, running out of cash flow, right? The portability of this, I think it's really, I think it's really interesting. And it's something that I'm not sh- I'm sure companies will have some ways to get their products out there, but it's going to open up a really interesting conversation as to how, how these are going to be brought into the plan, how you purchase them, how the person, you know, how the companies fund them. It's a great opportunity to protect and grow a lot of that wealth that is in your retirement plan. Another change which affects 529s and the distributions from 529s, you're now able to take $10,000 out of your 529 annually and apply it to qualified student loan. Before that would be taxable and then you could apply it, but you wouldn't get, you wasn't, wasn't a tax-free exchange. Now it is. So that's really exciting. So the rules have changed. Therefore, the variables have changed in your plan. And now there are different levers putting pressure on your wealth in a different methodology than it was last Thursday. So the key that we want to focus on is what changes should we make? How should we understand the impact of this law? Should we change our distribution methodology? Should we? There's so many choices. There's so many ideas. So I encourage you to take advantage of talking to an advisor at Smallwood Wealth Management set up a what we call it's a 30 minute introduction call we call it a wealth curve pressure identifier conversation it's basically a no obligation conversation to understand what's going on in your plan to understand where the financial pressures are and develop strategies to potentially solve those problems There's no obligation. We look forward to talking to you. If you're an existing client looking to this, the regular review is highly encouraged at at all times, and we hope to see you soon. More of this as we get a clearer picture of the exact rule changes and when they're and how they will be implemented, we'll be back in discussing this with you. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to the podcast and most importantly, share it with people that you believe this could be of value. Thank you. Welcome to the end of the video. Smallwood Wealth Management is an investment advisor representative. The opinions expressed by Smallwood Wealth Management and guests on this show are their own. All statements and opinions expressed are based upon information considered reliable, although it should not be relied upon as such. Any statements or opinions are subject to change without notice. Information presented for this educational purposes only. Moreover, no listener should assume that any discussions or information presented serves as a receipt of or substitute for personalized advice from Smallwood Wealth Management or from any other investment professional and is not intended as an offer of solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Smallwood Wealth Management is not a law firm or an accounting firm, and no portion of this presentation should be interpreted as legal, accounting, or tax advice. Information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as a recommendation appropriate for any individual. Listeners are encouraged to seek advice from a qualified tax legal or investment advisor to determine whether any information presented may be suitable for their specific situation. Thank you for listening.